cavalcade of sports is on the air. Gillette presents the World Series. This afternoon from Sportsman's Park in the Mound City, St. Louis, we bring you the play-by-play -play report of the sixth game in the colorful Hard Four Championship Baseball Classic between the St. Louis Browns and the St. Louis Cardinals. This is Don Dunphy with Bill Slater and Bill Corum greeting you for the Gillette Safety Razor Company, your radio host at outstanding sports attractions the year round. Well, here is the game that could be the final game of the series if the Cardinals win it. And if not, the Browns come through victorious. They will send it into seven games. Right now, it's the Cardinals, the National League champions, leading by three games to two. And what a great series it has been. The Brownies came through to take the first game by a score of two to one. Denny Galehouse out pitching Mort Cooper. In the second game, 11 innings, the Cardinals came back to tie it up three to two. Flick Stanley, a relief pitcher, out pointing Bob Muncreep another relief pitcher. <clears throat> and then the third game, the Brownies took first place again in this series, six to two. Jack Kramer out pitching Ted Wilkes, who was relieved early in the contest. The Cardinals tied it up on Saturday, winning five to one, when they unleashed their latent batting power. Harry Brackey in the southpaw, nipping Sigmund Jack Jacucki of the Browns. And so they went into yesterday's great battle between Mort Cooper and Denny Galehouse, the starting pitchers of the opening game, and the Cardinals won that one two to one on home runs by Ray Sanders and Denny Litwiler, or they might be playing yet. And so as we come up to the sixth game of the series, we find that the Cardinals are leading in games three to two. And if they win today, it's all over. If they don't win, if the Browns win, they'll go into a seventh and final game, which will be played on Wednesday. It's going to be the starting pitchers of the second game working today. Left-handed Max Lanier for the St. Louis Cardinals, and Nelson Potter for the St. Louis Browns. Neither of these pitchers finished that contest, that second game, although they both pitched very well. And now we've got the Browns lineup, and then we'll give you the Cardinals lineup. The Browns are going to be the visiting team today. They're weighing, wearing the visiting gray and operating in the dugout behind first base, while the home team today is the St. Louis Cardinals, batting last and in the dugout behind third base. For the St. Louis Browns, Don Gutteridge. Gutteridge, second base. The batting order, Don Gutteridge leading off, playing second base. Mike Krevich, center field. Gene Moore, right field. Vern Stevens, short dog. Chester Labs, L-A-A-B-S. Labs, left field. George McQuinn, McQuinn, first base. Mark Christman. C-H-R-I-S-T-M-A-N, Chrisman, third base. Myron, Red Hayworth, catching. Nelson Potter, P-O-T-T-E-R, -T -T Potter, pitching. During the regular campaign for the Browns, Potter won 19 and lost seven, leading the team in victories. The St. Louis Cardinals, Danny Litweiler, Litweiler, left field. Johnny Hopp, center field. Stanley Musial, right field. Walker Cooper, catching. Ray Sanders, first base. George Whitey Kurowski, K-U-R-O-W-S-K-I, Kurowski, third base. Marty Marion, Marion, shortstop. Emil Verban, V-E-R-B-A-N, Verban, second base. And Hubert Max Lanier, L-A-N-I-E-R, Lanier, as the pitcher. During the regular campaign, Lanier won 17 and lost 12. The umpires at the home plate, Bill McGowan of the American League. At first base, Tom Dunn of the National League. At second base, George Pipgrass of the American League. And at third base, John Ziggy Sears, S-E-A-R-S, of the National League. There it is again. Lefty Max Lanier on the mound for the Cardinals and the right-handed Nelson Potter on the mound for the St. Louis Browns. The teams are still going through their preliminary practice and while they're doing that, we're going to bring in one of our colleagues on these cavalcade of sports broadcasts, the well-known Bill Corum of the New York Journal American Sports Staff. Bill is already with some pre-game highlights. So, Bill, here it is. All right, Don. The sun here today is slightly a St. Louis prodigal sun. It's been in and it's been out and uh, now it's gone again though I think it'll be that way intermittently through this ball game. 
There's no real threat of rain here, so I'm sure we'll get this sixth game in the book, and, of course, that could be the end of the series. If by chance it is, the Cardinals will then have become the National League team to have won the most pennant, the uh, most World Championships. That will be five. They're now tied with the New York Giants at four apiece. The Yankees have won eight. And if the Browns are beaten today, they will stay in that select little circle of the major leagues, three teams, never to have won a World Championship. Those being Brooklyn, the Phillies, and if the Browns don't win this one, the Browns. Those are the essential figures on the situation as it stands. We come back now to the pitchers who opened the second game here. Potter of the Browns, who worked six in innings, gave up six hits and two runs, both unearned, two walks, and struck out three. He was not the losing pitcher in the game. Bob Moncrief was. That was that 11-inning thriller, the second game of the series that the Cards won 3-2. to two. Against him that day was Max Lanier, who pitched seven innings, yielded five hits, two runs, both earned, gave three bases on balls, and struck out six. Max was just sailing along until Crispin singled, Red Hayworth doubled, and pinch hitter Mancuso, batting for Potter, singled in the second, in the second and tying run, and uh, then when Mike Krivich doubled to start the seventh inning, why, Max was relieved by Blix Donnelly, who pitched such beautiful baseball and who'll be right here at his shoulder today. And that was the game, too, by the way, in which Donnelly made that marvelous play at third base, snatching up a butt and getting the runner and saving the Cardinals' bacon, much the same as Mort Cooper did yesterday on a bunt when he nailed Krivitz at second base. Many people think the crucial play of yesterday's great ball game. Now today is Thanksgiving Day up in Canada, and I know we've got a lot of listeners up there, many stations and a lot of listeners, and we give Thanksgiving down here that we've got such good neighbors up there, and uh, we hope it'll be a fine day there. Now I told you that the Cardinals have a great chance here to become the leading team in the National League at winning World Championships. And I was just down there talking to Lanier a minute ago, and he said, Bill, uh, I got to win this one. He said, it's been a long time now. I'm due to win a ball game. He's a nice boy, Max. Chunky, North Carolina kid. Uh, he had a brand new haircut today and is all sharpened up. I said to him, how's your arm? And he says, nothing wrong with my arm, and uh, I feel that I'm due to win a ball game. I suppose Potter feels the same way, though I didn't get a chance to talk to him. He's a nice young fellow from over here at Mount Morris, Illinois, and a great pitcher, the leading pitcher of the Browns this year with a record of 17, 19 victories and seven defeats, and a very fast right-hander who pitched good ball when he opposed Lanier before. The popular favorites in this series we see here at the park, and I'm sure you listeners know better perhaps than we do, uh, are the Browns, and that's only natural. They're a dramatic finish in the American League pennant race. The fact that they never have won, that they're sort of, in a sense, the poor relations of the Cardinals, and I know but nobody will take that amiss here because the Browns were the first team here, but in recent years, the Cardinals have won eight out of 19 pennants in their league, and they have been the people in St. Louis. So it's natural for Brown fans to be rooting for the Browns and for the whole country to be pulling for them. And they haven't played at any time, either at the end of the pennant race or in this series, like a team that had any intention of quitting, and I'm sure they're not going to. But they're up against sudden death today, and it could be that when the shades of evening come here to Sportsman Park again, another World Series will be in the book, and we who live back in the east will be heading across Old Man River and back home again. That's pretty much up to Potter and to this embattled Brown team that has its back to the wall here this afternoon. And speaking of the wall, I look out toward the right field pavilion and see for the first time a few empty spaces out there. Not too many, not too big patches. The crowd, to me, is surprisingly good. Of course, all the other seats except bleacher seats are sold, and uh, that's the only vacant spots that I see. And I think that is a surprisingly good showing since, after all, this is Blue Monday. Now, I just saw an old gentleman down there I, I always like to talk about because he's one of the grand, grand men of baseball, and that's Mr. Connie Mack. And I asked him last night about yesterday's game. He said, goodness gracious me, Bill, wasn't that a great ball game? And that's as near as Mr. Mack ever comes to profanity. He's just one of the grand men of baseball and indeed of this country. He won the Bach Award there in Philadelphia. And to see him here straight and spare and wonderful looking at 82 years old is a, is a great inspiration to us younger fellows. I also see the youngest magnet, that is, aside from a young Carpenter who just bought his way into the Philadelphia Phillies. And by the way, we'll have his general manager, Herb Pennock, up here in a few minutes. I see Horace Stoneham of the Giants. And there 
is a true baseball fan who never misses a World Series ball game, and it's a great pleasure to see him out here. And I know Horace is getting a whale of a kick out of the fact that up to now, at least, the Cardinals are leading because he's a great National Leaguer. And that's my story up to now. But I'll be back at the end of the game to give you my slant on the crucial plays in this climatic game of the series. Fans, there is an easy and a hard way of doing most everything. In shaving, the easy way is the old Gillette way. Yes, shaving's a cinch if you prepare your whiskers with Gillette shaving cream and breathe through them with today's Gillette Blue Blade. What shaves you get, how smooth and comfortable your face looks and feels. Now there are two Gillette shaving creams, lather and brushless. Choose the kind you prefer. Both are tops in their fields. Extremely fast-acting, thoroughgoing, beard-softening aids that really do the trick. Ask your dealer for Gillette shaving cream, lather or brushless, only a quarter. Well, the lineups have been announced over the public address system, and Max Lanier and Nelson Potter, the starting pitchers and possibly the finishing pitchers in this game, are still warming up. The Cardinals, of course, are the home team this afternoon. The Browns were the home team yesterday. Cardinals were the home team in the first two games. The Browns in the next three. And the Cardinals are the home team today. And if a seventh game is necessary, it will be played on Wednesday. The Cardinals will likewise be the home team in that, which means that they're wearing the white home uniforms operating in the dugout behind third base. And the Browns, the gray traveling uniforms operating in the dugout behind first base. The umpires have come out on the field now and gone over the rules with the two managers, Billy Southworth of the Cardinals and Luke Sewell of the St. Louis Browns and also catcher Walker Cooper of the Cardinals, who is the captain of that team. And now the Cardinals are going out on the field getting a very spontaneous hand. We're almost all set to go in the ball game now. The series stands at three games to two in favor of the Cardinals. Now this is Don Dunphy turning you over to my colleague. Oh, just a moment. The National Anthem. cover you through the first four and a half innings of what should be a great game in great St. Louis. Here is Bill Slater. Thank you, Don. Good afternoon, everyone. The facilities and services of the Baseball Commissioner, the National and American Leagues of Professional Baseball Clubs, the St. Louis National League Baseball Club, and the St. Louis American League Club have been furnished gratuitously to War Relief and Service Fund Incorporated, which is conducting this game. And the Baseball Commissioner, leagues and clubs, are acting as agents for War Relief and Service Fund Incorporated in conducting this game. Now we're going to pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is Mutual. This is WGN, the voice of the people, Chicago 11. It's the embattled Browns with an uphill job ahead of them and the Cardinals within one game of the 1944 World Championship who are about to clash on the surface of Sportsman's Park down below us there. We have a splendid vantage point up here in this magnificent booth. We get a clean, eagle-eye view of everything that happens on the playing surface. And as we look down there now, the leadoff hitter for Luke Sewell's Brown steps in. Don Gutteridge, the second baseman. Don's a right-handed batter. He's hitting at 167 for the season. He's had three hits out of 18 times up, one of them a double. Dark complexion Kansas lad standing square away in the batter's box. North Carolinian Max Lanier on the mound. Ready to go. Here comes Lanier's pitch. It's inside for ball one. The first pitch of the ball game in this sixth game of the 1944 World Series. 
This chap Gutteridge at the plate there was five years with the cards. He's been with Lincoln, Houston, and Sacramento, Columbus, Ohio, in his baseball career. A call strike. Lanier shoots in there. Curveball that broke in just above Gutteridge's knees. Strike one. One ball, one strike on Don Gutteridge, the speedy second baseman of the Brownies. Gutteridge stands there looking calm and collected, but you have an idea of what's going on in his heart. He wants a hit. Here it comes. He swings on it. It's a pop-up foul down the first baseline. Ray Sanders is chasing everybody away over near the stands. Takes it for the out. Gutteridge fouls out high to the first baseman. One away. And thus the ball game begins. Walking up to the plate now is the center fielder of the Browns, Mike Krebich, K-R-E-E-B-I-C-H. An Illinois lad who has been batting 227 in the series so far. Five hits out of 22 tries. Two of his five were doubles. Yesterday, he hit 500, two for four. Previous a right-handed batter, stands square away in the batter's box, takes a long grip on the bat. Max Lanier on the mound. Pitches to him. Previous swings and misses. Strike one. <laughs> one strike on Mike. Mike's played a lot of baseball, too. Been around with a lot of clubs. Des Moines, Los Angeles, Albany, Kansas City, the White Sox, the A's, McCook, Nebraska. Pitch to him is fouled off. Strike two. He reached out for that, looked as if he was going to try to place it right back over the infield somewhere, then decided, practically in the middle of his swing, to hold up a bit. And it was fouled off to the right. Two strikes on Krivich. It's the beginning of the ball game. One out, nobody on for the Browns in the top of the first. Lanier on the mound, pitches. Krivich takes it inside, a fastball, mighty fast. Ball one. One ball, two strikes. Now Max... Gets set out on the mound again. Gets the signal from Burley Walker Cooper. Behind the plate. Gets ready to fog another one in there to Mike Krivich. Here it comes. Krivich fouls it off against the screen behind the catcher. Plate umpire Billy McGowan puts a new ball in play. Lanier slips his glove off, holds it up under his arm, and turns around, gathers up some dirt, and rubs that ball up very carefully. Meanwhile, Krivich is still pushing that bat of his back and forth. All right. Here it comes. Krivich takes it inside. Two balls. Two balls, two strikes on Mike. Krivich began his career in organized baseball playing with McCook, Nebraska. Two and two count on Krivich. Lanier pitching carefully. Krivich swings, misses. Lanier strikes him out. Strikeout number 79 in this series. More than have ever been chalked up in any World Series before in history. They passed the record of 77 yesterday afternoon. Two away for the Browns in the top of the first. Gene Moore, the Texan, steps up there now. A left-handed hitter. Lanier, a left-handed pitcher, looking him over. He pitches. Moore goes for it and doesn't quite get it. He pulled up. It was a strike. Lanier looking mighty hot with that curveball. Left-handing it in there. Nobody on, two away. Top of the first. A crucial ball game. Here it comes. A call strike on Moore. Lanier was terrifically sharp with that one. It was a fastball in close. Over the inside corner, midway between the waist and knees. Now Gene Moore, who just wiggles that bat a little bit before he swings it, gets ready. Here it comes. He takes it. It's high. Above the shoulders and inside. Ball one. One ball, two strikes. Again this afternoon, good weather. Coolish kind of weather. A footballish twang to it. All right. One ball, two strikes on Moore. Here it comes. He fouls it off. It's still one ball, two strikes. On deck to come up if Moore manages to connect is Vern Stevens. Stevens led the Brownies in hitting yesterday. He got three hits out of four times up. Moore has been hitless for the last two games. He was one of the hitting stars of the first two games. The pitch to him, outside. It's a ball, two balls, two strikes. Moore has hit 2-11 for the season. Four hits out of 19 times up. Played with a lot of teams in his time. Here it comes to him. He takes it outside for ball three. A full count on Moore. Nobody on, two away, top of the first. This boy Moore has played down the Texas League. He's played with Peoria in the 3-I League, the Cards, the Braves, Brooklyn, Washington. 
in the World Series now at 35 with the Browns. A three and two count on him. Moore's gonna be put to it, so is Lanier. Here it comes. He takes a call, third strike. He's out. And Lanier strikes out two of them in the top of the first inning. Nothing across for the Brownies. Gutteridge fouled out to the first baseman Sanders, if you just tuned in. Previch went down swinging, and Moore was called out on a called third strike. So on the top of the first inning, no runs, no hits, none left on. For the Brownies, no errors for the Cards. The Cards, incidentally, have made just one error in the whole series up to this point. They established during the regular playing season, as you undoubtedly know, a new Major League fielding record. Now striding to the mound to pitch this afternoon for the Brownies, Mr. Nelson Potter. Boys call him Nelly. Potter hails from Mount Morris, Illinois. He lives in Mount Morris, went to school there. Back in 1943, last year, he won 10 and lost five for the Browns after being drafted from Louisville. This year, 1944, which is his sixth year in the majors, he's had his best record by far. So far this year, he has won 19 and lost seven in the regular season, which is by all odds the best record of any of the Brownie pitchers. So this afternoon, Behind in the series, Luke Sewell is able to throw on the mound the ace of his pitching staff, Nelly Potter. Now Potter rubs up the ball, takes a look at Danny Litweiler. Litweiler got a double and a home run yesterday. Swings on this one, bounces it foul outside at third base. Litweiler so far has hit 267 in the series, four hits out of 15 times up. Yesterday, as I told you, a double and a home run. Danny Litweiler, L-I-T-W-H-I-L-E-R, comes from Eastern Pennsylvania. One strike on him. Potter comes down overhand. Litweiler attempts to bunt it, misses it. Shakes up the Brownie infield. Litweiler is the first man up for the cards in the last half of the first inning. If he just got with us, there was no score in the top of the first. All right, Nelly Potter pitching to Danny Litweiler. Here it comes. Litweiler swings and misses, and he's striking out. He is striking out, and a lot of them are striking out. That's three strikeouts so far in this ball game out of the first four men to come up to the plate. Johnny Hopp stands in. A left-handed hitter is center fielder Johnny Hopp, batting 174 in the series, four hits out of 23 times up. He was uh, hitless yesterday. Galehouse struck him out three times. Swings on the first one. It's a high one. Going back of second base, Gutteridge is walking back on the grass. He's got it now. It took all that time for it to came, come down. It was hit so high up in the air by Mr. Johnny Hopp. Two up, two down in the last half of the first inning. Coming to the plate now is the big boy of the Cardinal batting order in this World Series, Donora, Pennsylvania's Stanley Musial. Or as you, Musial is batting at 368. The pitch to him, a call strike, a curveball that Potter got in there over the inside corner, waist high. Musial's 368 batting average is based on seven hits out of 19 times up. He swings on one, hits it to Gutteridge at second. Don feels it to throw to first. In time, he's out. And so the cards go down in order in the last half of the first inning. Nothing across for them. At the end of the first inning, the score is nothing to nothing. Ask Chicago fans what they think of Charlie Grimm, manager of the Cubs, and they'll say tops. Let's hear now from a great manager and one of the greatest first basemen who ever lived. Charlie, you're set to give the fans a new slant on Gillette Blue Blades, so go to it. Right, Bill. I wonder if the fans know that most ball players shave in the dressing room after batting practice, or just before they dress and leave the ballpark. That means they have to step on it. So their first choice is a Gillette Blue Blade. You can't touch it for fast shaves that look as good as they feel. You said it, Charlie, and thanks a lot. The Gillette Blue Blade is number one in the shaving league because it has the sharpest, smoothest finished edges modern methods can produce. Won't you men try it and see for yourself? Here's the start of the second inning now. Both sides went down in order in the top of the and the bottom of the first inning. Been 87 strikeouts so far. 87 strikeouts is the all-time record for World Series, made by the Cards versus the Athletics back in 1931. 
Browns and the Cards have surpassed the record for five games. Been uh, three strikeouts in this game so far. Burn Stevens is up, hits a long one foul down the right field line. Strike one. Stevens, a right handed batter, the shortstop, you know, a West Coast lad, hitting at 278 for the series. Five hits out of 18 tries. Yesterday was his big day. He got three for four. One strike on Stevens now. Here's the pitch. Lanier. A little bit outside with that. Ball one. One ball, one strike. Stevens might have been inspired yesterday. His 19-month-old son and his father were both here watching him. Swings on that one. Foul tips it onto the ground behind the catcher. Strike two. One ball, two strikes. No score in the game. We're into the second inning. This is the beginning of it. This chap Stevens has played a lot of places. Played in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, in the Middle Atlantic League, in San Antonio, in Toledo. Mayfield in the Kitty League. He's one of the standouts here, the Browns. Pitch by Lanier is low to him for ball two. Two balls, two strikes. Vernon Decatur Stevens, Jr. Right-handed batter with that very wide batting stance. His feet are spread just as far apart as his body will permit. Here it comes. He swings and misses. He, is, he strikes out. That's three of them. Lanier has struck out. He has struck out three out of the first four to face him. That, of course, goes right along with the, with the main point in this World Series. Tremendous pitching all the way through. Chester Labs, the left fielder, will try to break into this uh, pitching supremacy that Max Lanier has thrown up here to the first four men. Labs, a right-handed batter. And batting at 154. It's a call strike that Lanier comes through with. The curveball just above the knees on the outside corner to the right-handed hitter. Now Lanier takes plenty of time. He's wearing a red undershirt under his baseball shirt. Pitches inside. Labs leans back leisurely to get away from it. Ball one. One ball, one strike. Labs is a Michigan gentleman. Bright sun shining now on the playing surface of Sportsman's Park. Now Max Lanier bends way over, winds up, pitches, Lab swings on it. It's a long fly to deep center field. Hop is going back, back, back near the fence, and he can't get it. He dives against the fence. The ball rolls away from the fence. Labs is crossed second. He's heading for third, and he is held up at third with a triple, a terrific blow to center field. Johnny Hopp chased that clear back into the angle there in deep center field, 422 feet away. It fell beyond him as fast as he was going back there, and he's a pretty speedy man. So long and far was that blow struck by Chester Ladd. The first hit of the ball game, and what a hit. Now it's George McQuinn who stands in there. The Browns have a man at third with one out here in the start of the second inning. McQuinn swings on it, hits it back through the middle. It's going for a hit. A run scores. McQuinn, who is the leading hitter of the series on both teams, came through. He hit Lanier's first pitch right back through the middle, a ground ball into center field. And Chester Labs came galloping in from third, and the Browns are ahead one to nothing. And Ted Wilkes goes to work in the bullpen of the Cardinals. Man on first, one run in, one out now, and Christman up. There's a throw to first. McQuinn gets back in plenty of time. For Mr. McQuinn, that was his seventh hit of the series, and 15 times up. A call strike is the pitch to Christman. Mark Christman, Missouri lad. Hitting at 105 so far in the series. Two hits out of 19 times up. He was hitless yesterday against Mark Cooper. McQueen leads off first. The pitch to Christman swung on. It's a fly ball to center field. Hop is running in, is under it, is waiting. He's got it. Christman is out. McQueen holds it first. Two out. Two out. One run in here in the top of the second inning. Catcher Myron Hayward bats now. The right-handed hitter is Hayward, batting at 134 for the series. Two hits and 15 times up. One of his hits was a double. A North Carolinian is Mr. Hayward. Stands square away in the batter's box. Tall, rangy, and husky. Lanier pitches to him. Hayward swings and misses. Strike one. 
One run in in the top of the second. The Browns are ahead one to nothing. A fine crowd out here this sunny afternoon. Sunny and cool. Nolan there looks at first pitches to the plate. Hayworth swings and misses for strike two. Suddenly here, everything blew up in Mr. Lanier's face. Facing the first four batters, he was in splendid control. Struck out three of the first four. And Chester Labs rudely rocked the ship by tripling to Santa Fe. McQuinn followed with a single, and the Browns are out in front. Here's the pitch. It's fouled off. The count on Hayworth remains. Two strikes. McQuinn, the silent Virginian who came through with that run-producing single, Leading off first there, looking out toward the scoreboard. Finds it, I think, at the moment to his liking. Sees the Brownies ahead by one run. Hayworth anxious to prolong this Brownie rally here in the top of the second inning. Score one to nothing. Lanier anxious to snuff it out. Pitches now. Hayworth swings on it. It's a fly ball to center field. Hop is running in under it. He's under it now. He waits. He's got it. The side is retired. Hayworth flying out to center field. So the top of the second inning brings in a Brownie run on two hits. Labs triple and the Quinn's single. One man left on, no errors by the cards. So the Browns are one up on the cards as we go into the last half of the second inning. And thus the battle for the world's championship goes out here on the banks of the Father of Waters, the good old Mississippi, off to our right there. We can see the rolling hills of western Illinois and the great bridges that span the river here at St. Louis. Cheers from out in the crowd there. Cheers for Labs as he goes out to left field. The whole bleacher crowd out there and everybody in the stands giving him a tremendous ovation for that triple that he banged out just a moment ago. Now going to the mound with a one-run lead, Nelson Potter. Sturdy right-hander, the pitching ace of the Brownie squad, taking his warm-up pitches down here to Frank Mancuso, waiting for Red Hayworth, who was up at the plate as the inning was terminated, the top half of the second. Hayworth is all dressed up now and all those things a catcher wears. Comes out, takes the warm-up pitches from Potter, throws the ball down to second. The Brownie infield peppers it around there. And here we are leading off in the last half of the second inning. Big Walker Cooper. William Walker Cooper. If you want to be technical about it, steps up here. The right-handed batter is Cooper. A long ball hitter. He's had two doubles and a triple in the series. Swings on a curveball that he misses. Cooper's performance has been pretty good. Batted at 263, five hits out of 19 times up. Two doubles and a triple. Swings on that one, and a beautiful catch by Stevens. Magnificent. A terrific, sizzling line drive went right toward the shortstop. Stevens took a desperate leap up in the air. The ball stuck in the webbing of his glove. And when he came down, there it was, perched up there. He looked like a person holding an apple way up high for everyone to see. A magnificent catch by Vern Stevens. Cooper is out. Sanders steps in. A call strike Potter throws to him. That was a beautiful catch by Vern Stevens. A thriller. The thrills still reverberating through the stands in Sportsman's Park after that magnificent leaping catch of a hard-hit liner by Vern Stevens just a moment ago. Beautiful fielding. Sanders swings, lifts a high, lazy one into short center field. Coming in for it is the center fielder. Going back is Gutteridge. And Gutteridge and a group of four players makes the catch out there. Little old Don, speedy boy, scudding back on the grass there. The short center field gathered in that pop-up that Ray Sanders banged up there for them. Two out. Browns with a one-run lead. Moving in here. Anxious to hold these Cardinals. Two out. Nobody on. And George Whitey Kurowski, the hitter. Kurowski, a right-handed batter, hitting at 200. Had four hits out of 20 in the series. Got one yesterday. A pitch to him as he swings on this one. Hits it down past Crispin. Down the left field line. Crispin is chasing it, and Kurowski, taking his turn, holds that first. It's a hit. A hard hit ball in between Crispin and third base. Crispin got over to his right, knocked it down. It rolled away from him, but too far for him to go after it and make any play on Kurowski at first. It's a single for Kurowski on the first hit of the game off Nelson Potter. Puts a man on first, the first card to get on. Brings up long, lean Marty Marion, the shortstop, a right-handed hitter. Marion has hit three doubles in the series so far. Takes the first pitch, a curveball that broke away for ball one. Marion's hitting percentage in the series is 263. Five hits out of 19 tries at it. Yesterday, he was hitless. There's a throw to first, and they've got Kurowski trapped between first and second. McQuinn throws to Gutteridge. 
Gutteridge throws to first base where the pitcher is, and Kurowski is out. They ran down Kurowski between first and second. The pitcher caught him with too long a leadoff. Threw to the first baseman. McQuinn threw to Gutteridge. Gutteridge chased him back, and then when McQuinn broke and Kurowski got behind him, the pitcher came over to cover, and he was out. One to three to four to one is the scoring on that if you're doing it. So that's all for the cards in the last half of the second inning. No runs for them. One hit, none left on. No errors by the Browns. At the end of the second inning, the score is Browns 1, Cardinals nothing. There's no need for me to tell you why a duck's back sheds water. But do you know that tough whiskers do much the same thing for much the same reason? Yes, whiskers are naturally oily. So to give them a good soaking for smooth, easy shaving, first remove the water-resisting film that surrounds them. Gillette Brushless does that trick presto. Also, it blankets water right at the base of your bristles. And boy, how they drink it up. For extra shaving speed and comfort, use fast-acting, thoroughgoing Gillette Brushless. It helps soften whiskers in a jiffy, cleans your pores, lubricates your blade, protects your face. Also, it's grease-free and can't clog your razor or wash bowl drain. Ask your dealer for Gillette Brushless, only a quarter, and enjoy faster, easier shave. Nels Potter himself, who just made the put out on Kurowski, comes up, swings on the first ball, hits it down the left field line, and it's going foul. The left fielder down there, Littweiler, gave it a tremendous run, as did Martin Marion, but neither one could get to him. And it went foul, bounced up into the stands there. One strike on Nelson Potter. Potter went hitless in the first game that he pitched. No hits out of two times up so far in the series. This is his third appearance there. Now lefty Max Lanier pitches to him. A call strike, a very fast one. Might near burned a hole in Walker Cooper's glove. Potter, however, is standing there very calmly, batting left-handed. Let's the next one go, and it's just inside. A fastball that Lanier was trying to snip over the inside corner. Didn't quite get it. One ball, two strikes the count. One to nothing to score. Browns in front. Here it comes. Potter takes it. It's outside. Ball two. Two balls, two strikes. Yes, sir, a thrill a minute here in Sportsman's Park in the 1944 World Series. You just can't beat it. My goose pimples have come up and gone down so many times that I don't know what to do. Here's the pitch. Potter swings on it. Foul tips it. Two balls, two strikes. You get thrills, you get chills, your temperature goes up, it goes down as the tide of fortune sways back and forth between these two embattled St. Louis ball clubs. What a fight they are putting on. Here's the pitch to Potter. He takes it, and it's ball three. Lanier had two strikes on him. Now he's pitching very carefully, working for the outside corners, just missing them. In Mr. Potter's case, outfield is straight away, not too deep on Potter. Here comes the pitch, and it's a call third strike. That will be strikeout number four. For Mr. Max Lanier. One away, nobody on, and now the top of the Brown batting order comes up. That means the leadoff man, Don Gutteridge, who fouled out to Ray Sanders at first base his first time, will stand in here. Gutteridge, a fairly dangerous man, finds the outfield playing him straight away, fairly deep in left. The pitch to him, swung on, and blocked up foul back toward the dugout here. Here comes Big Walker Cooper, and he runs against the railing down here and can't get it. I don't think that hurt him. It would take more than a railing of that size to hurt that big fella. If anything, he hurt the railing. So if you're going to put out any sympathy, why well, give it to the railing. He's all right. Comes walking back in there. Almost got it. Stuck that long left hand of his up there in a Navy officer's lap, but the ball went in too deep for him. One strike the count on Gutteridge. Lanier working. Here it comes. Gutteridge swings on it, fouls it on the ground down the third baseline. Almost goes into the dugout of the Cardinals down there. Two strikes on Gutteridge. Gutteridge is heading overseas with Luke Sewell when the series is over to talk to men in hospitals and to help entertain soldiers. Here's the pitch to him. It's a fly down the right field line. Musial is running for it. Makes a beautiful catch on it in foul territory. A nice running catch by Stan Musial, the right fielder. And Gutteridge is out. A long foul down the right field line. Did it? That's twice Gutteridge has fouled out. Once to the first baseman and now deeper to the man behind the first baseman, the right fielder. Two away, nobody on. 
Top of the third inning, the Browns in front, one to nothing. They scored a run in the top of the second on Labs triple and McQuinn single, if you just came with us. It's Mike Krivich who comes up now, right-handed batter. Swings on the first one, laces it towards center field. Hop is running, running, running. He can't quite get it. He gets his glove on it. It bobbles away from him. Krivich is trying for second. Here comes the throw. He slides in safe at second. It's a double for Mike Krivich. The third hit for the Browns. The Browns have now had a single, a double, and a triple. Krivich is on at second. Johnny Hop made a valiant effort to get that one. Hop is very speedy, as I've said repeatedly. He was tearing with the speed of an express train to his left, stretched out his glove, it bounced off his glove, and Krivich made second. Two out, man on second, Gene Moore up. Moore was out on a call strike, his first appearance at the plate this afternoon. He's a left-handed batter. Takes the first pitch from Max Lanier. It's a ball outside, ball one. Krivich at second with a fair lead off, not too much. Moore standing there, jiggling that bat of his in that funny way he has. Takes a pitch that's low. It rolls away from Walker Cooper, but Krivich doesn't take any liberties with Cooper's throwing arm. He gets himself back to second. Two and all, the count on Gene Moore. Lanier will be pitching very cagely to Moore. Moore was a piece of poison for the cards in the first couple of games of the series. He's been sort of held in leash here the last two games. May break out now, you can't tell. Takes a pitch low for ball three. Three balls, no strikes on Gene Moore. The next batter after Moore is Vern Stevens, the shortstop. All right, Moore still standing there, practically motionless, except for that bat that he just jiggles up and down. Takes a pitch outside, a curveball that broke away, and Moore is walked. Ted Wilkes, Fulton, New York boy, is warming up in the bullpen for the Cardinals now. That's the first base on balls given up by either pitcher. It puts Moore at first with Krivich at second. And it brings up the man who drove in more runs than any other batter in the American League in 1944, Vern Stevens, a right-handed hitter who struck out his first time up today but was on a rampage yesterday, getting three for four. Stevens stands in there, spreads his feet wide apart, looks out at the pitcher, shoves his cap back on his head, takes a pitch low for ball one. The chant rises in the stands here as Max Lanier has a little trouble at the moment with his control. He was going along pretty smoothly here in the top of the third inning. Got the first two men out. Pronto. Then Krivich doubled. Moore has walked. Two away. Men on first and second. Stevens swings on it. It's to the right of Marion. He has it to play at second in time to force Moore and retire the side. And that might have been a hit in a lot of places, but not in the place where Martin Marion was. A beautiful throw. Forces Gene Moore at second. Six to four. The force out on Moore at second if you are scoring. And in the top of the third inning, no runs for the Browns. On one hit, two men left on. No errors by the Cardinals. So the Cardinals are behind by a run as we go into the last half of the third inning. And now we're going to pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is Mutual. This is WGN Chicago 11. You know, as Don and Bill and I have been working on this World Series out here in St. Louis, I've meant a lot of times to tell you all over the radio what uh, swell help and assistance we've had from the staff of KWK here in St. Louis, a great ra radio station. Harvey Smith has been the man who has uh, had the brains in the booth here during the series. He works all those funny little gadgets down there that I don't understand at all. This afternoon, oddly enough, his boss, Nick Zare, is helping him. I don't know why that is, but uh, at least it gets you out here at the ball game, doesn't it, Nick? John Tinia, the program manager down at KWK, has been a swell friend and a helper of ours, too, as has everybody on that staff there. One of the things that makes a great sporting event like the World Series pleasant, not only for those who come here to attend it, but for the lucky rest of us who come here to work on it. The cards are getting set to step in here. The cardinal batter is Marty Marion, who was standing in there back in the second inning when George Kurowski was caught between first and second. Run down by the pitcher, second baseman, and first baseman was Kurowski. Now Marion is going to start things all over again. The right-handed batter is long slats. Here comes Nelson Potter's pitch. He swings on it. It's a ground ball to Christman at third. He has it. The throw to first. In time by a stride. Marion is out. A nice play by Mark Christman, third baseman of the Brownies. One away in the home half of the third inning with the cards, the home team today. Second baseman, Emil Verbin, V-E-R-B-A-N. 
Illinois lad stands in, batting right-handed, hitting 286 for the series, four for 14. Potter pitches to him. It's high for ball one. You have a gentleman from Mount Morris, Illinois, pitching to a gentleman from Lincoln, Illinois. That's where Bourbon was born. Here's the pitch. He swings on it, pops it back of second base. A driving run in there by Krivich. He can't get it. He scoops it up instead. Boy, Krivich was taking his chances on that one. He was coming in with tremendous speed. The ball might have gone through him for extra bases, but he scooped it up. That's the courage with which the fielders on both sides have been going after these balls. That is hit number two off Nelson Potter. Puts Bourbon on at first and brings up Max Lanier. Lanier is a left-handed thrower and a right-handed batter. That doesn't happen very often. He swings on the first pitch from Potter, a strike. You see a lot of right-handed throwers at bat left-handed, but very few left-handed throwers at bat right-handed. Potter puts a throw over there to first, but Bourbon is back with plenty to spare. One strike on Lanier, the pitch swung on, hit back into center field. Previch a diving catch on it. No, he drops it. He came driving in on it. Thought he was going to make a diving catch on it, and he did too, but it popped out of his glove. We'll see how they score that. Could be a hit. It was a very hard hit, sinking line drive to short center field by Max Lanier, the left-handed man who bats right-handed and hits him. Yes, sir. Men on first and second now. Bourbon is at second. If Previch had held on to that, Bourbon would have been a dead goose. It scored as a hit for Mr. Lanier. Two hits to center now, and Nelson Potter is in some trouble. Men on first and second, one out, and up is Danny Litweiler. He hit a double and a homer yesterday. Potter pitches carefully, a curveball low to Litweiler. Ball one. A great many think that that long home run of Litweiler's to center field yesterday was the best hit ball of the series so far. Right now is when we're mostly concerned. Bourbon is leading off second, and Potter turns around, bluffs him back off. One ball to count on Pennsylvania's Danny Litweiler, a right-handed batter. He swings, misses, drops his bat. Bat went scudding off on the ground behind the plate umpire, Bill McGowan. A strike on Litweiler. Bobby Muncrief is working out in the bullpen of the Browns now. Men on first and second for the Cardinals. They have a rally underway here in the last half of the third. The Browns are ahead one to nothing. Cards on first and second. Lanier at first, Bourbon at second. One out. Litweiler up the count one ball one strike on him here's the pitch he swings and misses the count one ball two strikes that was about a three-quarter speed curveball that Potter had splendid control over and it broke away from Litweiler swinging back he couldn't get hold of it the outfield needless to say is pretty deep on Mr. Daniel Webster Litweiler Potter works here it comes Litweiler swings on it it's foul outside of third base Goes right past uh, manager Billy Southworth, coaching in the third base coaching box down there. Mike Gonzalez, coaching at first for the Cards. And that third base coaching box that I looked at the other day for you is completely worn bare of sod now. Those two managers pacing back and forth in it have just taken all the grass away. One ball, two strikes on Litweiler. Men on first and second. One out. Here it comes. Litweiler swings on it, fouls it off on the ground behind the catcher. Still the count is one ball, two strikes. Moncrief continues throwing in the bullpen for the Brownies. Litweiler bangs the business end of his bat down on the plate, grabs hold of it, spreads his legs apart. Potter peers in for Hayworth's signal, has it, stretches, pitches. Litweiler takes it. Outside it is. Ball two. Two balls, two strikes. Litweiler had a fairly extensive career, you know, with the Phils in the National League. Been a card now. This is his second year. Now again, Potter turns around and bluffs Emil Bourbon into moving back a little closer to second. Two and two to count on the batter, Litweiler. The pitch by Potter is swung on by Litweiler. He struck him out. Strikeout number two, that is, for Potter in this game. It came at a very important time as far as the Browns are concerned. Makes it two out now with men on first and second. Struck out the big man. Here comes the batter. It's Johnny Hopp, the center fielder who bats left-handed. 
Pop is looking for his fifth hit of the series. This is his 25th time at the plate. Potter stretches, pitches to Hop, Hop swings, misses, an inside curveball. Strike one. This boy Hop has played for Norfolk down in Virginia, Rochester, and Houston. Comes from a famous athletic family out in Hastings, Nebraska. One strike on him. Potter delivers. Hop takes it inside. Ball one. It was low inside, very close to his knees. One ball, one strike on Johnny Hop. Hop backs out of the batter's box. Potter stretches on the mound, looks at second, pitches to the plate. Hop swings on it, hits it down the right field line. It's going foul. A terrific line drive going foul down that right field line. Boy, if that had been fair, it would have hit something mighty hard. He had all the power, that 178 pounds of his back of that one. Crash, bang. Count is still one ball, two strikes on him. Everybody who ducked out there down the right field line, which was everybody, all you could see was people's heads sticking under seats practically. They're all back up again. Lanier is at first, Verbin is at second, two are out, Hop is up, the count, one ball, two strikes on him. Potter delivers, he strikes him out! In the last half of the third inning, no runs for the cards, two hits, two men left on, no errors by the Browns. At the end of the third inning, the score is Browns one, cards nothing. $250 million is a lot of cash. And that's the sum required for the National War Fund. Yes, this money is desperately needed to carry on the vital work of 22 major war-related welfare and relief organizations plus local community services. The National War Fund is split three ways. It goes to our fighting forces and fighting allies and to our needy neighbors at home. You contribute at one time in one gift to all recognized war relief and local charitable organizations. Furthermore, you'll not be asked to give again for a whole year. Don't let good news from Europe tighten up your purse strings. Your help is needed more now than ever. Open up your hearts and your pocketbooks, too. Give all you possibly can when the call comes in your community. The fourth inning. The Browns ahead, one to nothing. And coming to the plate now is the lad who had the big voice in putting them ahead. It's Chester Labs, whose terrific triple to center field. Back in the second inning, put him on at third where McQuinn drove him in. Labs, a right-handed batter. Max Lanier, a left-handed pitcher, pitches to him inside. Ball one. Lanier pitching very, very hard. And a good pitcher he is, too, that sturdy North Carolinian down there with the left throwing arm. Here it works, and Labs swings and misses. Strike one. One ball, one strike. Now Labs, a right-handed batter, stands in there, square away in the batter's box. Long grip on the bat, swings it back and forth. Here comes the pitch, it's outside. Ball two, two balls, one strike. The umpires are Bill McGowan at the plate, Tommy Dunn at first, George Pipgrass at second, and Ziggy Sears at third. On deck is George McQuinn. Lanier winds up, pitches inside. Ball three, three balls, one strike, as Lanier, of course, works very carefully to this lad who laced out a triple his last time up. Now Freddie Hoffman, coaching at first for the Brownies, claps his hands together, comes in there and shouts something at Labs. The pitch swung on and missed. Strike two. A full count. The string, she runs out. Three balls, two strikes. Something's going to happen now. Outfield is deep enough on Labs. They know him of old, and of old means that second inning. Here's the pitch, and it's fouled up right in our direction. <laughs> Boy, everybody ducked up here. Where have they all gone? Come back, man. All is well. <laughs> that was coming right at us. You could see the spinning seams on it. Three and two still is the count on Mr. Labs. Chet Labs has that little four-year-old boy of his out here in a brown uniform every day with a big number one on the back of it. Great camaraderie between the father and the son. The pitch is inside to Labs, and he's walked. Walk number two given up by Lanier. Puts Labs at first, brings up George McQuinn. 
McQuinn will present another problem for Lanier because McQuinn is the fellow who singled in that run back in the second inning. Left handed batter is Silent George, the Virginian. Stands a little deep in the batter's box, very loose and relaxed. There's a throw to first. Labs has to hurry to get back. Lanier has a very quick motion to first. And a bit of an advantage, of course, being a left hander, he's turned around that way. The pitch to McQuinn is bunted out toward the mound. Lanier has it. The throw is going to be at first. McQuinn is out. The sacrifice works. McQuinn sacrifices and is out. First to uh, out pitcher to first. One to three. Labs goes to second on the play. So there's a man in scoring position with one away. It's Labs at second. Mark Christman coming up to bat. Christman, a right handed hitter, has hit twice in the series so far. Stands square away on the batter's box, feet not too wide apart. Mark Cooper set Christman down without a hit yesterday. Christman swings, hits it back to second. Bourbon has it. The play is going to be at first. Labs goes to third. Christman is out at first. Second to first. Bourbon to Sanders. Now Labs is at third. He was at third back in the second inning with one out. He's at third now with two out. He's the only man on either team who has gotten to third so far. Now they're going to pass Myron Hayworth, which of course would be the strategy. First is open, and the pitcher is scheduled to hit next. So Hayworth is being purposely passed, an intentional pass to the big redhead. There's pitch out number three, here's pitch out number four, and Hayworth goes trotting down to first with an intentional pass, which becomes the third base on balls given up by Lanier. Puts men on first and third, Hayworth at first, Labs at third, and brings up the pitcher, Nelson Potter. Potter, a right-handed pitcher, a left-handed hitter. Lanier, a left-handed pitcher, a right-handed hitter. These pitchers just sort of cross back and forth on each other. Potter was called out on strikes his first time up in this game. Here comes the pitch. He swings on it. Hits it on the ground to Bourbon at second. He has it. The throw to first in time. Potter is out, and the side is retired. In the top of the fourth inning then, no runs for the Browns. Uh, no hits. Two men left on. And no errors by the Cards. So the score is still one to nothing. The Browns in front as the Cards come up for their turn of things here in the last half of the fourth inning. Tight and tense is this struggle. Of course, I think uh, practically everyone with ears in the whole civilized world knows that the Cards are ahead in the series by a score of three to two. They're trying to close it out and clinch the world championship today if they can. The Brownies, always a fighting team, spent a great deal of the season coming from behind. The position they occupy today is no novelty to them. They know what it means. They're the team that came in here with the last four games facing the New York Yankees, last year's world champions. In order to win, as it turned out, they had to beat the Yanks four straight. They beat the Yanks four straight. So they know what the darker side of what we laughingly call the eight ball is. And if they're behind, it doesn't mean anything to them. They're in there fighting all the time. Now Nels Potter who is a very definite part of the fighting strength of the Brownies and their ace pitcher of the year, is on the mound completing his warm-up pitches. As the cards get ready to come in there and swing that club in the last half of the fourth inning, the left-handed hitting right fielder, sturdy Stan Musial, will hit first. Musial has been tough for the Brownies. He's hit two doubles, a home run. Had a double yesterday out of three times up, batting at 368 for the series. The pitch to him, curveball outside and low, ball one. All right, here it comes. Musial takes it again. It's ball two. This lad Musial began his career as a pitcher for Williamson, West Virginia, down the Mountain State League. He was a pitcher and outfielder with Daytona Beach in the Florida State League, and because of his hitting prowess, became exclusively an outfielder. Played with Rochester and Springfield in the Western Association with the cards, of course. Here's the pitch to him. It's low and inside for ball three. Three in a row pitched in there to Musial by Nels Potter. Now Potter slips off his glove. Rubs up the ball a little bit. Looks in for Hayworth's signal. Shoots it in there. A call strike. Fast one. The automatic number. Three balls, one strike. That makes the count on Musio. Musio glances toward third to get the signal from Billy Hayworth. Southworth, he has him. The pitch. Swung on. A long fly ball to center field. Krevich is moving to his left, waiting for it. Waiting. He's got it. Musio is out on a fly to center. One out. In the last of the fourth, Walker Cooper 
The big catcher stands in, right-handed batter. His big walker. Walker's been around baseball, too. He's played with Mobile, Houston, Asheville, and Columbus, Ohio. Right-handed batter. Takes the first pitch inside of all. Potter was trying that inside curve on Cooper. Cooper didn't go for it, and it didn't nick the inside corner either. An airplane flying low over the park. Another inside pitch. Ball two on Cooper. And as this game wears along, with the Browns leading one to nothing by virtue of that run that they scored in the second inning, the tension gets greater and greater. Potter pitches high and inside to Cooper. Three balls. That's exactly the way he pitched to Musio. He gave him three that weren't over there, hoping to tempt him into offering on them. Now the count's 3-0. and oh. Comes through with one on the inside. He didn't get it in there, and Cooper has walked for the first base on balls that Potter has given up in this ball game. coming here in the last half of the fourth with one out. Now there's activity starting up again in the Brownie bullpen. Looks like Bob Muncrief. Ray Sanders, the batter, stands in there. Flied out to Don Gutteridge in short center field his last time up. Tall left-handed hitter. Swings on it and misses it. The long man went down almost to his knees after he had come through on that. Sanders stands about 6'2". 6'2 and a half. Weighs around 175. Cooper leading off first. There's a throw to first. Cooper gets back. Outfield is cut to the right on Sanders and mighty deep. And why not? He slammed a home run on the roof out there in right field yesterday. Here's the pitch. It's swung on. It's a ground ball to Gutteridge. It goes through into center field. Gutteridge making a terrific dive for it. And Cooper crosses the third. Cooper is at third, going all the way to third on a ground ball that was hit to the right of Don Gutteridge. Gutteridge threw himself on the ground, skidded across the dirt, trying to stop it. Couldn't. It went through in the center field for a hit. That is hit number four. Hit number four. Now Spotter puts cards on first and third. One away. Brings up Kurowski. Kurowski got a hit his last time up, a right-handed batter. All eyes on him now. He swings on this one. It's foul outside of third base. Southworth jumped out of the way. So did Walker Cooper, who was leading off third. Cooper is the first card who has gotten to third in this ball game. Coming here in the last to fourth with an incipient card rally in the fire. I didn't say insipid. I said incipient. The pitch to Kurowski. Swung on. Fouled into the stands down the first baseline. Strike two on Whitey. Men on first and third. Men on first and third. Two strikes on the batter. One out. Kurowski looking at the pitcher. The pitcher stretching. The pitch. Kurowski swings on it. It's a ground ball to shortstop. The play is at second. On to first. Not in time for a double play and the run scores. He's safe at second. The run scored. That ball was hit down to Stevens at shortstop. He had no time to make a play at the plate with Walker Cooper coming in there with the tying run. He threw to second to try to get Sanders. Sanders was safe at second, sliding in. The throw on to first was not in time to get Kurowski, and all hands are safe. It's an error on the throw. An error on Vern Stevens. Makes Sanders safe at second. And Kurowski is on at first on a fielder's choice. Men at first and second. One run in. The game all tied up. And up is Marty Marion. He hits a long one down the left field line. It's going foul and being caught by Labs. Way out deep down that left field line. The runners moving got themselves back to the places from whence they had come. Sanders got back to second. Kurowski back to first. The game is all tied up, one apiece. Marion is out on a long foul down the left field line. Gathered in by Chet Labs. Sanders leads off second, Kurowski off first. Two out, Emil Bourbon, who hit his last time up, stands in there, right-handed batter. Swinging that bat back and forth very menacingly. Potter delivers, Bourbon swings on it. It's a ground ball through at third base. 
Sanders is rounding third, heading for the plate. Here comes the throw to the plate. It's cut off by the pitcher, and all hands are safe, and another run scores. That was hit number five off Nelson Potter. A very timely single by Emo Bourbon into left field. It was hard hit on the ground to the left of Christman, who made a noble dive for it but could not stop it. Sanders scored from second. Kurowski went from first to second, and Bourbon is on at first. And the cards are ahead two to one. Up next is Max Lemire. He slaps a single right back through the box. Coming in to score is Bourbon. Run number three. Coming in to score is Kurowski, rather, I beg your pardon. Run number three. Bourbon is at second. And here comes Luke Sewell out of the dugout. That was two hits for Lemaire. That was his second hit. He hit the first ball pitch. And now the Cards have three runs in here in the last of the fourth inning. And Luke Sewell comes out to the mound where Nelson Potter, who has been pretty well bashed around in this particular inning, he's been reached for three hits, the last two coming in succession to put the cards out in front. Give you a resume of it. Stan Musial opened the inning by flying out to center. Then Cooper was walked. Sanders came through with a single. Cooper going to third. Then Kurowski hit one down to Stevens. Stevens committed an error on his throw to second. Sanders was safe there. Cooper scoring. And Kurowski was safe at first. Then Marty Marion was out on a long foul ball down the left field line. Emil Verben, however, came through with a hit. Lanier came through with a hit. And the result of it all is three runs. Bob Muncrief is coming in. That'll be all for Nelson Potter. Nelson Potter goes out here in the last half of the fourth inning with men on first and second, three runs in. And the cards out in front by a score of three to one. And unless the Brownies tie this up and go on to win or lose, why, Potter will remain the losing pitcher. Bob Muncrief, a tall right-hander, stands 6'1", weighs around 190, hails from Medill, Oklahoma, M-A-D-I-L-L. And now while Muncrief is taking his warm-up pitches to come in here and take over the job from Nelson Potter, we're going to pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is Mutual. This is WGM, the voice of the people, Chicago 11. Bob Muncrief was the losing pitcher in the second game when he came in to relieve uh, Nelson Potter. Blix Donnelly, who came in to relieve Max Lanier, who started against Potter today, was the winning pitcher in that second game. Muncrief's job right now is to get one man out. There are men on first and second. Lanier, now wearing one of those brilliant, silky-looking sweat jerseys of the Cardinals, is leading off first. Emil Verbin, who drove in a run with a single to left, is leading off second. Three runs have scored. The cards are in front, three to one. The top of the batting order, Danny Litwiler, comes up. Litwiler, a right-handed batter, has struck out twice. Potter has had the Indian sign on Litwiler. Let's see how Muncrief does with him. Or let's see how Litwiler does with Muncrief. During the season, Muncrief won 13, lost eight. Pitches to Litwiler, who swings and misses. Strike one. Muncrief, a very determined kind of a fellow. Good-looking, brown-haired man. One strike he has on Litwiler. Men lead off first and second. Lanier and Verbin. Here it comes. He swings on it. It goes to the shortstop. The play is at second, forcing Lanier and retiring the side. Litwiler bangs into a force out. And in the last half of the fourth inning, three runs for the Cardinals on one, two, three hits. Two men left on and one error by the Browns. At the end of the fourth inning, the score is St. Louis Cardinals 3, St. Louis Browns 1. Charlie Grimm hit it on the nose when he told you that you can't touch the Gillette Blue Blade for fast, good-looking shades. He's right, and here's why. It takes exclusive equipment and the knowledge to operate it to produce a blade so sharp and beautifully finished. It's a treat to see the plant where Gillette blades are made. Every operation is checked and rechecked by skilled technicians equipped with high-powered microscopes and other scientific instruments. Steel is tempered to glass-cutting hardness in Gillette-designed furnaces. Only the other day, a great watchmaker prevailed upon us to harden spring steel for an exacting contract. I could tell you more about the methods and skill required to produce the blade that tops them all. 
But for now, just let me urge you to try today's Gillette Blue Blade. If your dealer happens to be out, remember he'll have more soon. It's the top of the fifth inning. And the Brownies are in the hole now with the cards out in front by a score of 3-1. to one. We'll put up the top of their batting order. Don Gutteridge, who has fouled out twice in this game, once to the first baseman, once to the right fielder, stands in there. Max Lanier, who has slammed out two hits in his own behalf and leads now 3-1, to one, pitches to Gutteridge, a call strike, a fast one. Lanier just drew back and left-handed that one in there. Came in midway between the waist and knees. So fast you could scarcely see it. The outfielder straight away on Gutteridge, not too deep. All right, Lanier bends over, winds up, pitches a slow ball that Gutteridge hits deep to left field. Going back is Litwiler, very near the wall and near the line. He's got it. Gutteridge swinging on a slow ball, lifted it high and far down the left field line into the glove of Daniel Webster Litwiler. One out, nobody on for the Browns. Top of the fifth, cards in front, three to one. Center fielder Mike Krivich, another right-handed batter, comes up there. The shortest man on the Brownie squad, stocky looking. Oski gentleman from Illinois. In the wintertime, he drives his milk truck around over there. Exercises on milk cans. Fouls off the first pitch into the stands, down the first baseline. Krivich, a veteran, played a lot of baseball in his time. Played it all mighty well, too. All right, Mike with the long grip on his bat, waves that club back and forth. Lanier stands there looking at the catcher. Winds up now, comes through with it. It's high. Ball one. One ball, one strike. Nobody on, one out. Fifth inning. Cards with a big rally in the last to fourth. Came through with three runs to take the lead, three to one. The overhand pitch swung on and missed. Strike two. Krivich gave that the old Gazatskalu. He didn't get any of it. He went round and round. One ball, two strikes. <laughs> Lanier comes down overhand. It's high. Didn't come down enough. Two balls, two strikes. So the cards are ahead now. Three games to two, and they're ahead in this ball game three to one. But if you think the Browns are licked, don't make the mistake of going away now. A call, third strike comes in on Krivich. That's the second time Lanier has struck him out. Two out. That makes five strikeouts for Max Lanier in this ball game. We've had a lot of fun here and practically needed an adding machine to keep track of these strikeouts during this series. Every time you look up there, somebody's getting struck out. Two out now. Gene Moore up. Left-handed hitter. Lanier works on him. Here it comes. Moore swings on it. It's a ground ball down to first. Sanders bobbles it. Picks it up. Throws to Lanier. And he's out. A beautiful play, and Lanier was the key to it. A hard-hit ground ball to Sanders got away from him. He scampered after it and threw to Lanier, who just beat Moore to the bag. Just stuck his foot in there ahead of Moore's foot. That Lanier has been doing everything this afternoon. Moore is out, first baseman to pitch it. And that's all for the Browns in the top of the fifth. Nothing across for them. So going into the last half of the fifth inning, the score is St. Louis Cardinals 3 and the St. Louis Browns 1. And now here to bring you the remainder of this sixth of the World Series games of 1944 sensational series on the banks of the old Mississippi and St. Louis, our colleague on our Cavalcade of Sports trio, Mr. Don Dunphy. Don, here she is. You'll never get a better ball game than this one, boy. Thank you, Bill Slater. Good afternoon again, everyone. Three to one, favor the Cardinals as they, the home team, come up for the last half of the fifth inning. I'd like to remind you, listeners, that the facilities and services of the Baseball Commissioner, the National and American Leagues of Professional Baseball Clubs, the St. Louis National Baseball Club, and the St. Louis American League Club have been furnished gratuitously to War Relief and Service Fund Incorporated, which is conducting this game. And the Baseball Commissioner, leagues, and clubs are acting as agents for War Relief and Service Fund Incorporated in conducting this game. Now the last half of the fifth inning. Leading off for the National League champions, the Cardinals, Johnny Huff. Johnny popped out to Gutteridge in the first inning and struck out in the third. Left-hand batter. Digs in, straightaway stance. They play him a bit to the right. Bob Muncrief, the second hurler on the mound for the Browns, goes to work. The right-hander delivers, and there's a high pop-up between short and third. Stevens is going for it, calls, and takes it. A hard chance in the glaring sun. One out. Johnny Huff pops out to the shortstop. 
Stanley Musial coming up. Stanley is hitless in this game so far. He was out second to first in the first inning and fly to center in the fourth when he let off that frame. <coughs> Musial bats left-handed. Already Moncrief goes into his motion. Here's the pitch. Curve is high. Ball one. One and nothing. Big right hand that delivers. And there's a high pop up to the infield. Stevens calls for it back of second. He's got it. Musial pops out to the shortstop. Two up, two down the same way. Jack Kramer. Is keeping loose out in the Brownie bullpen. Which probably means that the first chance there is for a pinch hitter for Muncrief, there will be one. Walker Cooper coming up. He lined to Stevens, who made a great catch in the second inning, walked and scored a run in the fourth. Muncrief goes into his motion. There's a pitch driven back over the mound, over second. A stop by Gutteridge, a throw, not in time. It's an infield hit. Cooper bangs one over the mound, back of second base. Gutteridge made a nice stop, running far to his right, through to first, but not in time. An infield hit for Cooper. That's the first hit off Muncrief, and seven hits in all for the Cardinals. Ray Sanders up. One hit and two trips to the plate today. Hit a home run yesterday. Muncrief stretches. Here's the pitch. Up high, ball one. One and nothing. Sanders, a left-hand batter. They play him deep, a bit to the right. Throw to first, leisurely. Walker Cooper back safely. Manager Billy Southworth coaching at third, and Mike Gonzalez at first. Here's the pitch. Swung and missed. Strike, one and one. A sharp curve inside. One ball, one strike. Moncrief getting the side from catcher Red Hayworth. Three to one, favor the Cardinals. Last half of the fifth inning. Is the pitch. It's inside. Ball two. Two and one. <clears throat> two balls, one strike. Ray Sanders up there. Crowds the plate a little bit. Uncreased stretches. Throws to first. Cooper back safely. Two out. Walker Cooper on first base. There's a stretch. Is the pitch. A curve is low. Ball three, a sharp curve down around the ankles. Three and one. <coughs> a little bit cooler out here today, but a nice day nevertheless. A warming sun. Muncrief stretches and throws to first. Cooper goes back. Here's the pitch. Inside, he walked him. Ball four. Sanders down to first base. Cooper moving to second, and Whitey Kurowski comes up. Kurowski single in the second inning. Got on by a fearless choice in the fourth. Scored a run in that fourth inning. Two out, two on. Last half of the fifth inning. Cardinals leading three to one. Here's the pitch. And there's a long drive headed out into left center field. Krevich goes over to his right, takes it for the out. Nice running catch by Krivich. Ending the inning. In the fifth inning, the Cardinals, no runs, one hit, two left, and no brownie errors. At the end of five innings, the Cardinals, three, the Browns, one. One of the greatest southpaws of all time, Herb Pennock, general manager of the Philadelphia Phillies, is our guest up here this afternoon. He pitched in eight different World Series and has never been beaten. Now, Herb, you're a number one rooter for Gillette Brushless Shaving Cream. Come in and tell the fans why that is. You bet I'm a rooter for Gillette Brushless, Don. It has everything a man could ask for in a shaving cream. I mean, it softens your beard and makes shaving easy. What's more, it does the job fast and leaves your face feeling swell. Thanks, Herb, and I think it's important to add that Gillette Brushless is grease-free. It can't clog your razor or wash bowl drain. Now, fans, a big tube costs only 25 cents. Ask for Gillette Brushless and enjoy extra shaving speed and comfort. So this ball game moves along. Now we come into the first half of the sixth inning. The St. Louis Cardinals 
trying desperately to win the world's championship and the St. Louis Browns trying to prevent them from doing so. The Cardinals lead three games to two. If they win this one, it's all over. And they're leading three to one as Vern Stevens comes up in the sixth inning. Vern struck out in the second, hit into a force out in the third. Lanier delivers. And there's a ground ball down to short. Marion has it. There's a the throw. He's out. Stevens out, short to first. Chet Labs up. Labs banged a long double, a 400-footer to center for a triple in the second inning and walked in the fourth. So Lanier hasn't gotten him out yet. Lanier has given up only three hits, single, a double, and a triple. Here's the pitch. Fastball outside. Ball one. Cardinals have Litweiler in left, Hoffman, Satter, Musial in right. Kurowski, Marion, Bourbon, Sanders in the infield. Walker, Cooper catching. Hubert, Max Lanier, a left-hander on the mound. The pitch. Inside. Ball two. He missed the inside corner. Two and nothing the count. Big crowd of great St. Louis folks out here today. Here's the pitch. Swung and foul back. Strike one. Two and one. Two balls, one strike. George McQuinn on deck. Brownies unleashed their one-two punch in that second inning when Labs triple and McQuinn singled. The Cardinals came back in the fourth inning for three runs, and they're out in front three to one in the sixth inning. Here's the pitch. Outside, ball three. Three and one now. Three balls, one strike. Lanier has had trouble with Labs all afternoon. Just uh, tripled in the second and walked in the fourth. Now it's three balls, one strike. He digs in. Will it be hit or take? Here's the pitch. He swings and fouls it over the roof behind first base. Strike two now, a full count, three and two. Manager Luke Sewell coaching at third. Freddie Hoffman coaching at first for the Browns. Three balls, two strikes, one out, nobody on. The first half of the sixth inning. Sixth game of the World Series. Lanier goes into his motion, pumps. Here it comes. It's high. He walked him again. Ball four. Labs goes to first. Here comes McQuinn, and the crowd stirs. That is base on balls number four off Lanier. George McQuinn up. George has the only Brown home run of the series. A four-master, which won the first game. He singled to drive in Labs with the Browns only run in this one. Lanier stretches. The pitch... A strike, a curveball coming over the outside corner. Strike one. Ray Sanders holding Labs close to first. Lanier, you know, has a quick motion to first. He stretches. Labs gets off a little. The pitch. A curve outside. Ball one. One and one. McQuinn looks them over. Left hand batter straight away stands. He crowds the plate a little. Here's the pitch. Outside. Ball two. Two and one. Umpire Bill McGowan decides to examine the baseball and tosses it out of play. A new one goes out to Lanier. McQuinn is the leading batter of the, season, the series here with seven hits and 15 trips to the plate. Two balls, one strike on him. Crowd sitting around, very tense. Here's the pitch. And it's outside. A curveball breaking away. Ball three, three and one. Ted Wilkes, a right-hander, who was warmed up on and off throughout this game, goes to work again out in the Cardinal bullpen. Three balls, one strike on McQuinn. Labs on first. Here's the pitch. Strike two. He came over with that one on the corner. Full count, three and two, just as it was on Labs before him. Now there's one out. Let's see if Labs goes down on this pitch. Three and two. McQuinn up. Lanier stretches. Labs goes down and it's fouled off. Fouled right back. Three and two. Labs in breaking for second that time was the first batter, or rather the first runner to break for second, or for any 
succeeding pace throughout the whole series without there being two out. Other times when there were two out, the man on first to second, first and second, three and two, they moved. Here's the pitch. Up high, he walked him. All four. That is five faces on balls off Lanier. And here comes Mark Chrisman. And Billy Southworth comes out of the Cardinal dugout to talk to Lanier. Will he leave him in? Labs on second. McQuinn on first. If they get around, the ball game will be tied up. Southworth has come out of that dugout several times during the series to talk to Cardinal pitchers. And never once have they failed to come through after that little conversation with him. Lanier will stay in, and Southworth goes back to the dugout. Chrisman only has two hits and 21 trips to the plate in this series. He's been up twice in this game without a hit. Here's the pitch. It's low. It gets away from Cooper. Going down a third is left. He's safe. McQuinn on second. The runners advance. a wild pitch for Lanier. The runners advance. Two men in scoring position now. It's ball one on Christmas. Labs on third. McQuinn on second. Lanier came in with a sharp one that bounced in front of the plate. Caromed off Walker Cooper's glove. Cooper picked it up quickly through to third, but Labs slid in safely. Labs is on third. McQuinn on second. And now the Brownie infield, which had been playing back, moves in. Jack Kramer, a right-hander, is now warming up in the Browns bullpen. And again, Southworth comes out of the Cardinal dugout. Here is drama at its peak. And now the crowd is starting to boo Southworth as he comes out. Though the Cardinal fans are cheering them as well. Billy's within his rights, though. He's got a right to go out and talk to that pitcher to see how he feels. You know, Lanier was troubled with a sore back in the last month of the campaign. And Southworth is going to ask him just how he feels, whether or not he should, thinks he should stay in there. Ted Wilkes, meanwhile, is warming up very hard out in the Cardinal bullpen. Kramer is getting ready in the Browns bullpen, which probably means there might be a pinch hitter. And now Lanier is coming out. The third base umpire, Ziggy Sears, goes down to the bullpen to get Wilkes and bring him in. Lanier is going out. Lanier in his tenure on the mound, five and one-third innings, has given up three hits, one run, Struck out five and walked five. But this last wild pitch was his undoing. The second wild pitch given up by a Cardinal hurler in the series, by the way. Ted Wilkes is coming into work now. Wilkes was in one game. He didn't finish it. He was driven out in a round batting assault. He worked two and two-thirds innings. Gave up five hits, four runs. All of them being earned, by the way. He walked three and struck out three. Here's a hand for Lanier as he goes out. This is one of the most crucial moments in the entire series. And believe me, folks, there have been many crucial moments. The situation is the Cardinals leading three games to two. And leading three runs to one in this game, three to one. But there is one out on the Brown sixth inning. Chrisman up and men on second and third. Wilkes, Ted Wilkes, W-I-L-K-S. Coming into pitch now for the Cardinals. He's facing Chrisman. And there is one ball on Chrisman. Should Chrisman walk, the walk will be charged against Lanier. Ted Wilkes, a Fulton, New York boy, 29 years old, 5 feet 9 and a half, weighing 178 pounds, a right-hander. Ball one on Christmas. Wilkes winds up. Here it is. He swings the ground ball down to third. Kurowski has it. Throws home. He's out. Out at home. Wynn stays on second, and Chrisman is on first, a fielder's choice. That was a hard wrap down towards Kurowski. He picked it up through home to Walker Cooper, and Labs was out, sliding in. Five to two if you're scoring. McQuinn stayed on second because 
If Kurowski had not thrown home, he would have been trapped between second and third. And now it's Hayworth up with men on first and second. Wilkes getting the sign from Walker Cooper. Two out now. Wilkes stretches. Here's the pitch. Swung and missed. Strike one. One strike. Moncrief is scheduled to bat next. Here's the pitch to Hayworth. He swings and drives a long one deep out into left. It curves foul as it goes up in the stand. Sylvester Blickstone now warming up out in the Cardinal bullpen. Two strikes on Hayworth. That was a fine play by Kurowski on that bounder by Christman. It was a tricky bounder. And he had a backup to take it, but he made a rifle throw into Walker Cooper to cut down labs. Two strikes on Hayworth. Here's the pitch. And there's a long fly going deep out into center field. Hop is going back to his right and takes it. Ted Wells, Johnny on the spot. A good relief pitcher there. Got Chrisman to bang into an out. And Hayworth a fly to center, ending the rally. In the sixth inning, the Browns, no runs, no hits, two left. No errors. At the end of the first half of the sixth inning, the Cardinals are leading by a score of three to one. Marty Mary and Emil Verbin and uh, Ted Wilkes will be the ones to come up in this frame for the St. Louis Cardinals. Moncrief delivers, and there's a high pop-up to the infield. McQuinn is calling for it, so is Gutteridge. McQuinn waves him away and takes it back on the grass. Marion pops out to the first baseman. One out. Jack Kramer continues to warm up out in the Browns' bullpen, which no doubt means a pinch hitter for Moncrief come next inning. Bourbon up. Two hits today for him. Here's the pitch. A curve comes over for a strike. Coming right down the middle. Bourbon, single to center, and was left in the third, single to left to drive in a run in the fourth. Here's the pitch. Strike two. That curve nipped the outside corner. No balls, two strikes. Ted Wilkes on deck. Here's the pitch. And the ground ball through the box for a hit out into center field. Grievich fields it back in. Bourbon's third hit of the afternoon. Three out of three for him. That's the second hit off Moncrief. Bourbon now has 17, seven hits and 17 trips to the plate. Wilkes up, making his first appearance at bat. Ball bunted back to the mound. Moncrief has it, throw to first. He's out. Sacrifice. Two out, Bourbon going to second. was Moncrief to McQuinn, retiring Wilkes. Danny Litwiler coming up. Danny struck out in the first and third innings, set into a force out in the fourth. A right-hand batter. Man in scoring position, Bourbon. Moncrief stretches. Here's the pitch. He swings and lifts a long fly out into left center. Krivich moving over, gets under it. He's got it. Litwiler flies out to center. Cardinals in the sixth inning. No runs. One hit. One left. And no brown errors. At the end of six innings, the score is St. Louis Cardinals three. The Browns one. Have you ever longed to move west? Well, here is your chance to do that and perform a vital service for your country. Thousands of civilian workers are desperately needed now in Pacific Coast Navy Yards. These establishments back up our Pacific fleet that's slugging it out with the Japs. Ships must be repaired and returned to fighting condition. Supplies must be kept moving. And thousands of men are needed, both skilled and unskilled, to keep things humming. If you're not engaged in equally important war work, go to your nearest United States Employment Service office or your local civil service representative regarding jobs in West Coast Navy Yards. You get housing reservations before you leave. Free transportation, vacation and sick benefits. 
If you're an unskilled worker, you earn while you learn in the Navy Yard. And now we're going to pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is Mutual. WGN Chicago 11. As we move into the seventh inning of this vital World Series game out here in St. Louis, Alan Zarilla, a left-handed batter, who has one hit and nine trips to the plate in the series, is coming up to bat for Moncrief. Ted Wilkes pitching for the Cardinals. Swung and missed. Strike one, a fastball. Coming down, blaze, blazing fast down the middle. Zarilla went around on it. Left-hand batter, wide stance, right foot towards first. Outfield pull to the right. Here's the pitch. Inside, ball one, one and one. Cirilla is from Los Angeles, California. Seventh inning. The Brownies trailing three to one. If the Cardinals win, it's all over. Here's the pitch. And there's a high foul coming back on the screen. Walker Cooper started after it, then let it go as he saw he couldn't get near it. One ball, two strikes on Zarilla. Z-A-R-I-L-L-A. Alan Zarilla. Called Zeke by his teammates. Another pinch hitter waiting on deck. To bat for Gutteridge, I believe. Here's the pitch. And there's a foul coming back in the stands behind third. One ball, two strikes on Zarilla. One of the fans made a great catch in there and got a hand from the crowd. Floyd Baker is waiting on deck to hit for Gutteridge. Luke Sewell going all out with his pinch hitters. Ted Wilkes working. Here's the pitch. Struck him out. Zarella goes down swinging. Strikeout number one by Wilkes and number nine of the game. And now the, the Browns and the Cardinals have tied the strikeout record of 87 set by the Cardinals and the Philadelphia Athletics back in 1931. One more and it's a new series record. Here's Baker batting Floyd Baker batting for Gutteridge a left hand batter no hits and one trip to the plate in this series outside ball one one and nothing Ted Wilkes goes into his motion there's a the pitch swung and missed for a strike a high fast one. He went around on it. One ball, one strike. One out. Nobody on. The Cardinals lead in the series. Three games to two. And in this game, after trailing one to nothing, they came back and are leading three to one. Wilkes goes into his motion. The pitch fouled right back. Strike two. One and two. Mike Krivich on deck. The Browns have gotten only three hits today. A triple by Labs, followed by a single by McQuinn for a run, and a double by Krivich in the third inning. One ball, two strikes. Baker up. Floyd Baker, B-A-K-E-R. Wilkes winds up easily, throws. A curve comes over for a strike. And there is a new strikeout record, 88. Now the Browns and Cardinals in this series have set a new strikeout record for all World Series competition, 88. And any subsequent strikeout will make a new record. Krivich up. He struck out in the first, doubled in the third, and was called out on strikes in the fifth inning. Two out, nobody on. The seventh inning, a very fast game. A very exciting one. Important. Here it is. A line drive headed out into right center. Musial goes racing over and makes the catch, a dandy catch. That was a line drive into right center. Stanley Musial went racing over. Nabbed it down at his shoot top. Stumbled, but held on to the ball. And the Browns in the seventh inning go out in order. No runs, no hits, none left. And no errors by the Cardinals. The end of the first half of the seventh inning, the score. St. Louis Cardinals three and the Browns one. Just as soon as the game ends today, Bill Corum will give you the highlights as he saw them from the press box. Don't miss his dramatic, colorful story. Stay tuned for Bill Corum. Going in at second base for the Browns, Floyd Baker, who batted for Gutteridge. Baker, 
now playing second base. Waiting for the new Brown Hurler to make his appearance. We're not going to give it to you until it's official. Jack Kramer was warming up out in the bullpen. Kramer won Friday's game for the Browns, six to two. In nine innings, he gave up seven hits, struck out ten, and walked two. Pitched a courageous game because the Cardinals threatened many times in the late innings. Coming out of the Brown dugout now, Jack Kramer. New Orleans lad. Good looking fellow with a lot of stuff. Just coming out now. The Cardinal hitters in this frame will be Johnny Hop, Stanley Musial, and Walker Cooper. Kramer is announced. He's the pitcher. 117 and lost 13 during the regular season. John Henry Kramer, born and lives in New Orleans, six feet one and a half, 185, and 26 years old. After receiving an honorable discharge from the CBs back in 1943, Kramer won eight and lost two for Toledo. He has one victory to his credit in the series, no defeats. Series stands at Three games to two in favor of the Cardinals. If they win tonight, it's all over. They're the world's champions. However, if the Browns win, the series will go to the seventh game, which will be played on Wednesday. Johnny Hopp coming up to bat for the Cardinals in the last half of the seventh inning. Johnny has been up three times today without a hit. George Castor is now warming up in the Browns' bullpen. And Harry Brackeen warming up in the Cardinals' bullpen. Kramer goes into his motion. Here's the pitch. Up high, ball one. One and nothing. It's uphill now for the Browns. They've got two innings, and they're trailing three to one. The Cardinals now up in the last of the seven. Here's the pitch. Outside, ball two, a curve breaking away. Two and nothing. Kramer smooths out the dirt, tosses away a pebble out there on the hill. <laughs> Cardinals have gotten eight hits so far today. Six off Potter, two off Muncreep. Hop batting left-handed. Kramer goes into his motion. Here it comes. A strike, a fastball right down the middle. Two and one. Hop steps out for a moment, looks down at Mike Gonzalez for a sign. Here's the pitch, swung and missed, strike two. Johnny Hop up. Hop has four hits and 26 trips to the plate in the series. Kramer goes into that right-handed motion of his, an easy motion, throws, and there's a high foul coming up in the stands behind third base. Both Hayworth, the catcher, and Chrisman, the third baseman, go for it, can't get it. Two balls, two strikes. The count on Hippity Hop. Flicks Donnelly and Harry Brackeen. A right-hander and a left-hander warming up in the cards bullpen. George Castor warming up for the Browns. Kramer goes into his motion. Here's the pitch. And there's a line drive headed out into left center. Labs comes in. He can't get it. It's a base hit for Hop. He tries for... He tries for two and he's trapped. He thought the ball was caught. Now he's being run down and tagged out by McQuinn. Well, what do you know about that? What do you know about that? Hop did a fly out into left center field and apparently thought that Labs caught the ball, but Labs took it on one hop. And much to the amazement of yours truly and everyone else in the ballpark, Hop, after rounding first, trotted down to second in the manner they do when their fly is caught. And he was an easy dead duck. However, manager Billy Southworth patted him on the back as he went into the 
Cardinal dugout. That's why Billy gets such great play from those Cardinals. Musial up outside, ball one. Well, you probably won't see a play like that in a long time. That scored seven to six to three to two, I believe. But anyway, Hop is out. There's a high pop-up, a foul down towards third. Chrisman is under it. He's got it. Musial fouls out to the third baseman. We'll try to get the scoring on that hop out for you. Pretty near every brownie in the ballpark handled the ball. Walker Cooper up. Lined out to Stevens who made a great catch in the second. Walked and scored in the fourth. Got an infield hit in the fifth. Here's the pitch. A ground ball headed out to left field. It's a clean hit. Labs is coming in. He throws it back in. Cooper popped down first. And the crowd is yelling, go down. That's hit number two off Kramer. Hop gets credit for a single on his blow, but he's out. Then Musial fouled out to the third baseman, and Cooper has now singled to left. Ray Sanders up. One out of two today, plus a base on balls. Sanders bats left-handed. Kramer stretches. Walker Cooper on first. Here's the pitch. A strike, a fastball coming down the middle. Strike one. The scoring on that hop out is seven to six to three to four. That's left field, a shortstop to first base to second base. Sanders waits, Kramer stretches. Here's the pitch. Inside, ball one. One and one. One ball, one strike. Sanders up. Kramer stretches, Walker Cooper on first, two out. Here's the pitch. A strike, a curveball. Comes over the outside corner, one and two. One ball, two strikes. Two out, Walker Cooper on first. The Cardinals leading three to one. The Brownies having at least two more chances. Kramer gets up on the rubber. He takes a lot of time with men on. There's a pitch. Swung and missed. A strikeout. Sanders goes down swinging. In the seventh inning, the Cardinals, no runs, two hits, one left, and no errors. At the end of the seventh inning, the score is the St. Louis Cardinals three, the Browns one. Herb Pennock set a mouthful when he told you at the end of the fifth, that Gillette Brushless speeds shaving and makes it more comfortable as well. Yes, Gillette Brushless does just that. It enables you to whip into the job and get it over in a hurry. You see, this cream removes the oil from your whiskers and blankets plenty of water right against them. So they get a good soaking and soften up in no time at all. More than that, it protects your skin from irritation, is free from grease, rinses instantly, and can't clog your razor or washbowl drains. If you like brushless, You'll prefer Gillette Brushless by all odds. See for yourself. Ask for a tube of Gillette Brushless Shaving Cream. Only 25 cents. While the folks out in the center field bleachers are kidding Johnny Hop as he goes out to his post out there. But you can't kid when Johnny goes for those fly balls in the outfield. He's one of the great center fielders of the game. Gene Moore, Vern Stevens, and Chester Labs for the Browns in the eighth inning. The sands of time are running out on the Brownies just as the shadows creep over Sportsman's Park out here in St. Louis in the sixth game. Wilkes goes into his motion, and there's a high foul coming up into the stands just below us. Strike one. The Cardinals need this game to win the World's Championship of 1944. They're leading three games to two. They're leading in this game three to one. Ted Wilkes is on the mound for St. Louis Cardinal. Gene Moore at bat for the Browns. Moore up twice officially without a hit. Here's the pitch. And he drives a liner out past second base. Taken by Verbum. And he's out. That was a blooper back of second. Verbum went tearing over and pulled it down. Moore out to the second base. And one out. Stevens up. Fouls it. 
It bounces one back to the first baseline. Wilkes has it. He's out. That was a dribbler down towards first. For a moment, I thought it might go foul, but it stayed in. Wilkes. Sharp as a shiny, keen razor blade. Pounced on that ball and threw him out. Two out. Labs up. Here's the man Lanier couldn't get out. Let's see what he does with Wilkes. Labs banged out a tremendous triple and scored a run in the second. The Browns' lone run. Subsequently driven in by McQuinn. Then he walked in two previous successive trips. Wilkes comes down with a strike. A curveball over the middle. Strike one. There's the pitch. Swung and missed. Strike two. A sharp curve outside. Two out. Nobody on in the Browns' eighth inning. Now they're fighting uphill, but still fighting. Is the pitch. It's high. Ball one. One and two. Left hand to Harry Brackeen. Will beat the Browns on Saturday. Warming up out in the bullpen with Flex Donnelly. Is the pitch. A curve breaks away. Gets away from Walker Cooper. It's now two and two. Two balls. Two strikes. A new ball goes out to Wilkes. George McQuinn on deck. The Browns haven't gotten a man on base off of this Wilkes. There's a curve breaking away. Ball three, three and two. Wilkes relieved Lanier with one out in the sixth inning. Men on second and third, and they haven't gotten anyone on except Chrisman, who hit into a fearless choice. A man being out at the plate. Here's the pitch. And there's a high foul going out down the right field line. Sanders goes back for it and makes the catch. Labs fouls out to Sanders. The Browns in the eighth inning. No runs, no hits, none left, and no card errors. And that leaves the Brownies the ninth inning. At the end of the first half of the eighth inning, St. Louis Cardinals three. St. Louis Browns won in this great World Series out in the great municipality of St. Louis. Remember, fans, stay tuned for Bill Corum when the game ends. He'll give you the stirring human side of what's happening out on the diamond this afternoon. Last half of the eighth inning, Jack Kramer on the mound for the Browns. Gave up two hits in the previous inning. He's going to face Kurowski, Marion, and Bourbon the National League champions, the Cardinals. Krauski has been up at bat 23 times in this series and has five hits. Last half of the eighth inning, the Cardinals three, the Browns one. And the Cardinals leading in game three to two are home if they win this one. The Browns are going to fight it out in that ninth inning. They've come from behind so many times this year that no one here in this ballpark is counting them out. We'll have the attendance figures for you in just a moment. Here's Kurowski coming up now to lead off the Cardinal eighth. A right-hand batter. Kramer, a cool workum, workman, goes into his motion. He pumps. Is the pitch. A slow ball, too high. Ball one. He pulled the string on that one. Struck. Ball one. One or nothing. Kramer winds up. Here it is. A foul, a hard foul driven past third base, and it split the bat. Kurowski walks in for a new bat. The bat boy brings it out to him. One ball, one strike. The attendance today, ladies and gentlemen, 31,630. The lowest attendance of the series. The total receipts today, $142,062. One ball, one strike on Kurowski. Kramer with a new ball. Goes into his motion. Throws. Inside. Ball two. It almost hit him. Kurowski ducked away. Two balls, one strike. Not a batter has been hit with a pitch ball in the series. We hope we don't jinx anyone by saying that. Here's the pitch. But we think we ought to report it anyway. Ball three. Down low. Three and one. Krauski has one hit and three trips to the plate in this game.
Kramer getting the sign. Here it comes. It's fouled, and now we have a full count, three and two. The foul came back on the screen. Three and two. Score is three to one, favor the Cardinals. Last half of the eighth inning. Kurowski leading off in this frame has a full count. Marty Marion on deck. Kramer goes into his windup. Here's the pitch. He walked him. Ball four. Base on balls to Kurowski. Brings up Marty Marion. Marion has five hits and 22 trips to the plate in the series. Chrisman, the third baseman, moves in expecting a bunt. Here's the pitch. He punts it down towards first. Kramer has it. Fumbles it. Throws. He's out just in time. The crowd got a thrill out of that one. That was close. Marion bunted down towards first. Kramer came in, fumbled the ball. Fumbled it again. Picked it up and whipped a rifle throw to McQuinn. It's a sacrifice for Marion, and he's out. Pitcher to first. Kurowski goes to second. And Bourbon. Bourbon, who has been in the Browns here all afternoon, is up. Bourbon is leading the Cardinals at bat with a mark of 4-12 now. Seven hits and 17 trips to the plate. And he's being honored with an intentional pass. McQuinn is hitting 467 for the Browns, leading all the batters in the series. Bourbon, single to center in the third inning today, single to left in the fourth, drove in a run, and single to center again in the sixth inning. And now he's getting an intentional pass, which means he's got three out of three for the afternoon. Ted Wilkes coming up. Ted Wilkes, who's great relief pitching today, following Max Lanier to the mound, has saved the Cardinals up to now. George Castro, a right-hander, warming up in the Brownie bullpen. Krowski on second, Bourbon on first, one out. Kramer stretches, Wilkes waits, right-hand batter. Outfield straight away, the pitch. He tries to punt, misses. There's a throw down to second, it gets through Stevens. Krowski is coming up to third, and Bourbon goes to second. Strategy backfired that time. That's an error for the catcher, Hayworth. Wilkes tried to bunt and missed for strike two. And Hayworth trying to pick Kurowski off second, threw the ball into center field. Kurowski went to third and Bourbon to second by the time Krevich got the ball back. That's an error for Hayworth. And now Wilkes has two strikes on him, and the Browns infield is drawn in close. The Cardinals leading three to one. No balls, two strikes on Wilkes. Kramer shakes off one sign by Hayworth. Now takes another. He's pitching with a windup. Here's the pitch. High, ball one. One ball, two strikes. Another tense situation in a tense series. Wilkes batting right handed. One ball, two strikes. Browns trying to hold here. Here's the pitch. Inside. Ball two. Two and two. A curve ball missed the inside corner. Plate umpire is Bill McGowan of the American League. Tom Dunn of the National at second. George Pipgrass of the American. At rather Tom Dunn at first. Pipgrass at second. And Sears of the National at third. Two and two on Wilkes. Kurowski on third. Bourbon on second is halfway up to third. Here's the pitch. Outside, ball three. Missed the outside corner. Kramer is upset about that. And he's walking around, talking to his teammates. Three and two. A full count on Wilkes. Litwiler on deck. And George Castor, a veteran right-hander, warming up hard in the Browns' bullpen. Score is three to one. Favor the Cardinals. Last half of the eighth inning. Kramer getting the sign now from Hayworth. Now he's winding up. Here's the pitch. And he struck him out. Wilkes called out on strikes, taking a third one. That's the second strikeout for Kramer. And now the Brown infield goes back to normal playing position as Litwiler comes up with two out. Litwiler has been up four times without a hit in this game, and Potter, who preceded 
Other Brown pitches to the mound today. Struck him out twice. But Wilder up. Two out, two on. Men on second and third. Here's the pitch. He swings and misses. Strike one. Lit Wilder has four hits and 19 official trips to the plate in the series. One of them a home run yesterday. Strike one. Kramer winds up. Here's the pitch. And there's a drive right down to Stevens on one bounce. He throws. He's out. But while I hit the hard one with Stevens who took it on one bounce and threw him out. The Cardinals in the eighth inning. No runs. No hits. Two left. And one brown error. At the end of the eighth inning, the score is the Cardinals three. The Browns one. You've seen a base runner break from first on the windup only to be nailed at second. We saw that today. He was the victim of a pitch out. He was outguessed. Well, when it comes to outguessing tough beard, Gillette lather shaving cream is right in there, too. You see, it's water that softens wiry whiskers for quick, easy shaving. And it's water that Gillette lather holds the barrel of. Yes, sir, this cream holds water as a sponge does and releases it freely, soaking every bristle through and through. Not only that, but Gillette lather stays wet on your face, keeping your stubble properly conditioned for your razor all the time you're shaving. Men enjoy slick, easy shaves, smooth-looking and refreshing. Ask for Gillette Lather Shaving Cream. Only a quarter. Here's the ninth inning. And let's see if those Cinderella Browns can come from behind as they did so many times during the great American League season. George McQuinn, Mark Christman, and Red Hayworth in that order. McQuinn up. Ninth inning, the Cardinals are leading three to one. McQuinn up. Here's the pitch. A strike. All right. There's the pitch. Inside, ball one. One ball, one strike on McQuinn. McQuinn drove in the only brown run with a single after Labs had triple in the second. He takes it low for ball two, two and one. Flick Stanley, a right-hander. Harry Burkina, a left-hander in the Cards bullpen. Three to one, favor the Cardinals in the ninth inning. Here's the pitch. He swings a high foul, comes back on the screen. Two and two. Two balls, two strikes on McQuinn. Milton Burns is waiting on deck to hit for Chrisman. Browns have not gotten a hit off Wilkes. They haven't gotten a man on base, except Chrisman, who went into a fieldless choice. Here's the pitch. And there's another high foul coming up near the third base stands. Kurowski comes tearing over. He can't get it as it goes up in the stands. There's a scramble for that ball down there. About a dozen fans are milling around trying to get it. Two and two the count on McQuinn. George is leading the batters of both teams in this series hitting 467. McQuinn, by the way, is batting a thousand today. A single, a sacrifice, and a walk. Wilkes goes into that easy motion of his. Here's the pitch. And there's a long fly headed out towards left field. It's curving. Litwiler it goes over and takes it in foul territory. A great running catch. Running into the stands after he gathered it in. A great running catch by Danny Litweiler and Whitey Kurowski, who was out there chasing it himself, said, "Atta boy, Danny. One out, McQuinn flies out to left to Litweiler. Milton Burns, B-Y-R-N-E-S, is coming up now. Mike Shartak, another pinch hitter on deck. Burns batting left-handed. Swings and misses, strike one. Time and everything else running out on the Browns now. Two outs left. They need two runs to tie. They're back three to one. Is the pitch high? Ball one. One and one on Burns. Batting for Chrisman. Here it is. It's high. Ball two. Burns is a St. Louis boy. He'd like to come through now before the home folks. Wilkes getting the sign. He's kept the Browns away so far. Here's the pitch. It's low. Ball three. You never can tell. 
Three and one. Burns has been at bat once in the series, officially without a hit. Mike Shartak on deck. Wilkes goes into his motion. Here it is. Strike two. A curveball comes blazing over. Three and two now. One out, nobody on. The Browns fighting it out, trailing two to three to one. Here's the pitch. He swings and misses. A strikeout victim. Burns goes down swinging. Strikeout number three for Wilkes. Mike Shartak is coming up now. He also hits left-handed. He's a Brooklyn boy. Shartak has been up once officially without a hit. The Cardinals are within one out of being the world's champions. Wilkes, here's the pitch. High, ball one. Wilkes is turning in one of the great relief jobs of the World Series. Here it is. High, ball two, two and nothing. Wilkes working very carefully. Three to one. Southworth comes out of the Cardinal dugout now to talk to Wilkes. The last time Billy came out to talk to Lanier, Lanier uncorked a wild pitch. There'll be no wild pitch now, though. There's no one on. Two or nothing on Shartak. Wilkes goes into his motion. Here's the pitch. Strike. There's a fastball coming on the outside corner. Frank Mancuso is on deck. In case the game is prolonged, is the pitch. He swings and misses. Strike two, two and two. The end draws near, but the Brownies are in there fighting it out under the game leadership of Luke Sewell, coaching at third. Two and two. Let's see now. This could be the last pitch. Here it is. And he struck him out. It's all over. Great relief pitching. And all the Cardinals come tearing out of the dugout to grab Ted Wilkes, including Mort Cooper down there, who pitched a great game himself yesterday. The final score, the St. Louis Cardinals 3, the Browns 1. And the Cardinals take the World Series of 1944, four games to two. The world's champions, the St. Louis Cardinals. Congratulations to them. And also congratulations to the losing Browns who fought a great game battle. Bill Corum of the New York Journal American Sports staff will be here in just a moment to give me the highlights of today's game as he saw them from the press box. There's a major league outfielder who played 189 consecutive games without making an error. If you ask me, that's going some. But think of the amazing record run up by the folks who inspect Gillette Blue Blades. Millions and millions of blades are produced at shaving headquarters, but only perfect ones ever reach you. Seventeen separate inspections assure absolutely uniform quality. Then, the Gillette Blue Blade has the sharpest, easiest shaving and longest lasting edges that science and skill can produce. So, for the best looking shaves, the smoothest and most refreshing a man can have, always use today's Gillette Blue Blade in your Gillette razor. The roar you just heard go up from the crowd, was the announcement over the public address system that the St. Louis Cardinals, managed by Billy Southworth, are the world's champions again. Now this is Don Dunphy speaking for Bill Slater and thanking you for your attention in this series and turning you over to a great sportsman and a Cardinal rooter a little bit, I think. Our friend from the New York Journal American, our colleague on these cavalcade of sports broadcasts, Bill Corum. All right, Don, it was a great series, wasn't it? Yes, it is. Good a series as anybody could have expected, maybe better than anybody could have hoped for. The crowd stuck to the last, the Browns stuck to the last, and fought it out as we wrapped up the 41st World Series and the first All St. Louis World Series in Lavender and Old Lace here this afternoon with the Cardinals winning four games to two, or four out of six if you like it that way, on three runs, ten hits, and no errors, one run for the Browns, three hits, and two errors for them. The Cardinals made just one error in the series, and that was 
a questionable error by Musial, Musial in right field in yesterday's game. Now, this has been a strikeout series all the way through. Today, they established a new record for World Series play with 92, 14 between the two teams today, and that breaks the old record of 87 set by the Cubs and the A's back there in 1929. The Browns were just one short of the strikeout record set by the Cubs in 29, which was 50. Just one short. They got 44 today. Now, I don't think we can take too much time up here, but I want to say that uh, everything about this series has been as smooth and as pleasant and as good. Great umpiring. The crowd has been nonpartisan. I said before the game opened that I thought the general, general sentiment throughout the country was in favor of the Browns. I still say that because we Americans root for the underdog, and definitely the Browns were the underdog. It was generally accepted by baseball people that the Cardinals were the best wartime ball team. They've proved that now, winning two World Series under great little old Billy Southworth in the last three and being in the other one and winning their championship where the Yankees failed. And so definitely the Cardinals stamped themselves as the best wartime team in baseball and a team, I'm sure personally, that could take its place with normal in normal times with any ball clubs anywhere. Lanier today was knocked out of the box, and this is a peculiar thing. You almost never see a pitcher go out after he's given only three hits. But Lanier went out here this afternoon because he was beginning to press. He threw a wild pitch that worried Southworth, and he rushed Ted Wilkes in, who pitched a perfect relief job. I think Lanier might have made it, but uh, anyhow, he gets credit for the game, and that's the second game he's won in two World Series. He didn't finish either one of them. In fact, he didn't start the other one. The one he got credit for was 1942 against the Yankees when the Cards used a whole flock of pitchers, and Lanier was the one finally given credit. Now, the crowd today was 31,630 persons, paid $142,062 into the chest of the War Relief and Service Fund. Again, the day was sunny almost throughout, not quite as perfect as the other days, and now the big crowd files off of the field here at Old Sportsman Park, entirely satisfied, I'm sure. Not only with the showing of the Cardinals, but with the showing of the dead game Browns and Luke Sewell's outfit, who never said die in the American League race and wouldn't say die in this series, came up with their usual six-inning rally and shook the cards right down to their heels, and it took great baseball to peg them back in that inning. You may be sure one of the plays being Whitey Karowski's courageous shot to Cooper at the plate to head off a runner there and peg the Browns back. The Cards have done that right through the series, taken chances, and as indicated by their record of only one error, have made those chances good because of their beautiful play. It would be unfair not to say that the play of Marion at shortstop has been something out of a storybook. Lots of grand plays. Hop made a beautiful catch out there. I'm talking now about the series as a whole and out of this one game. Stevens turned in some gorgeous plays at shortstop. McQuinn was a tower of strength for the Brownies at first base and probably wound up the series as the leading hitter, though I haven't got the figures right here yet. I haven't had time to total up my scorecard, but he was leading going into the day, and Musial was the next hitter, and Musial wasn't very potent today. Emo Verban was getting three hits. Every time he came up, his first three times, three singles. Great little ball player, and all the way through. Cooper's catching, I think, has been superb. He let a fastball get away from him, but uh, it might have been scored a wild pitch. The scoring has been good, however. The umpiring, why, the umpires must just be patting themselves on the back. The boys hardly said one off unpleasant word. They hardly looked at an umpire in this whole series. And that's a wonderful thing. I know Judge Land is listening in, and we hope he is. Must be ha happy at the way Leslie O'Connor, Ford Frick, and the handsome Mr. Will Harridge of the American League have run this series and the way it's been conducted in true American-like sportsmanship with fair play everywhere, and we want to thank your listeners for being entirely fair and so good to us to overlook the mistakes that must happen when people are talking fast and trying to think fast and add up a lot of figures and keep records that run back for 50 years. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do. I hear on every hand that my colleagues Don Dunphy and Bill Slater have turned in a wonderful job. The people out here in St. Louis are beginning to like them very much, and that makes us very happy. I think Don's around here somewhere, and I'm going to let him say a little more. I don't know where Slater has disappeared to, but I want to bring Don back for any final observations he might like to make on the series. Come in, Don. Well, Bill, I uh, just want to say what you have already intimated and what the fans who saw the series and those who have listened to it already know that it was one whale of a series, and 
uh, right up until yesterday, it was very much in doubt. The teams went into yesterday's game 2 all, and I might say that I think the play that finally ruined the Browns as far as winning was concerned was Mort Cooper's great play on an attempted sacrifice bunt to throw out Moore yesterday. From that time on, the Cardinals seemed to roll on, but the Browns fought on. They took the lead today, and even when the Cardinals passed them 3-1, to one, the Brownies, the Cinderella team of 1944, continued to fight on. I just want to thank the good people out here in St. Louis, the sports writers, the editorial writers, and all of them for their hospitality, and we hope we'll be back here soon again. Bill? Right, Don, we might go over the final figures right quickly once for the sixth and final game of the series, in case somebody tuned in late. The Cardinals won three runs, ten hits, no errors. The Browns one run, three hits, and two errors, and the Cardinals won the baseball championship of the world in the best four out of six games. And fans, that's that. And the Sega of another World Series goes into the book. But Gillette's Cavalcade of Sports carries on. Every Friday night, the year round, we're on the air at 10 o'clock Eastern War Time with a rousing, fast action sports event over most of these same stations. Join Don Dunphy and me Friday nights on the Cavalcade of Sports, and we'll have fun. So, fans, until next Friday night at 10 o'clock Eastern War Time, this is Bill Corum saying smooth sailing, smooth shaving, and good afternoon from your host the Gillette Safety Razor Company, Don Dunphy, and Bill Slater. This is Mutual. This is WGN, the voice of the people, Chicago 11.